finish today's message, um, Matters of the Heart, and next week we're going to deal with Thanksgiving. So if you're not a thankful person, you might not want to come next week. But hopefully you're thankful enough and you're going to show up next week. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to move on to Emmanuel, God with us for the month of December as we move towards Christmas. Uh, but I wanted to finish this Heart Matters Up and kind of set the stage here for next week as we look at Thanksgiving in our hearts uh, and those types of things. But uh, in looking, the, setting this up, I wanted to show us this video here. And I want you to just look at this video for a moment. There's no sound. It's just a video footage. Um, and uh, we see this elderly gentleman having uh, considerable difficulty uh, trying to maneuver across this uh, road here. Uh, and we see this kind gentleman get, stop his car, get out, pick him up, and carry him across. That's, that is, I hope that's you. I really do. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. I hope that's you. And it's so neat to see what Jesus would call, what Jesus would identify as, who is, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? There was a neighbor here. This gentleman showed kindness and compassion towards a person he probably did not know by stopping his car and getting out. But I want you to note something else. How many cars, motorcycles, and people drove around this guy. They just missed him. No, or well, they saw him. They had to swerve to get around him, but they missed him. And that's what we want to talk about today, and I want to address when it comes to people and needs in our heart and having the heart of Christ. Jesus clearly defined in Scripture when the guy said, Who is my neighbor? We see that come out in Scripture. Your neighbor is the one you should be helping and then we further define that when we look at the idea of the Good Samaritan, and we had the priest, and we had the Levite, and then we had the Samaritan. And I want to just ask you to have a heart check as we move into this season. We should be this way all year long. But I want us to look at this heart check and say, where, where am I at? How am I? Sometimes we can even be a little self-righteous. When you think, it's important for me because I'm leading the prayer meeting. I better get to church. I don't have time to stop and help this guy across the road. Oh, I, I, I'm leading worship. I, I, gotta be, I don't have time to do that. i, I got to preach the sermon. Isn't that the priest? Isn't that the Levite? But who did Jesus hold up as the example? The Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan caught the heart of Christ. Because in the mix of what was happening in his life, he saw a human being in need. And he addressed that need. If we want to reflect and show the heart of God in our lives, we can't be about where we're headed. We have to recognize the moment at where we're at. And that person, you're laying in a hospital bed, the person next to you might be your mission. Meanwhile, sometimes we lay in that hospital bed thinking, I got to get to this. I'm supposed to do that. But God has brought you to that place not to ignore a person like so many of these drivers did, but to give you an opportunity to show his heart and compassion for them. Don't get me wrong. Love, as we're going to talk about this morning, love is not something that, that you just say, well, I'm, I, I let them do whatever they want to do. But no, love, love intervenes in people's lives. Love will cost you time. And you cannot love if you will not take time. If you want to know how selfish of a person it is, you are, you don't find your selfishness by your checkbook. It may be a little reflection, but you'll find your selfishness by the time you give in the moments and opportunities you're given. We're going to come back to that in a few scriptures, but I want to start out with this people and needs and time and love and the very character of Christ, this heart check 
It says in first, or it says in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, it says this. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. You want to be a good witness? Love. Love each other. Love the believer. Love the unbeliever. Love the healthy. Love the sick. Love the rich. Love the poor. In fact, there's no excuse to do anything but love in Christ Jesus. We're called to love. It should be our identity. It is our heartbeat. It is our passion. And while we can sometimes do well at loving a little bit, this is something that requires the Holy Spirit's help to do in the way Christ calls us to do it, to love one another, that we show that love, to show that compassion, we show that care. This is the commandment. This is the new command I give you. Love each other. Romans chapter 13, verse 8 says this, Owe nothing to anyone except the obligation of love to one another. If you love your neighbor, you will be fulfilling the requirements of the law. If you love your neighbor. You want to talk holiness today? If we really want to talk holiness, it's not the length of the hair. Good thing for me. It's not whether I have a beard or the length of my sleeve or the length of my dress. Or Holiness, here, you fulfill the requirements of the law when you love one another. When you stop your car on the busy intersection, on your way to a very important meeting to do something great for God, and you care about the individual God has placed in your life at that moment. A teacher in a classroom, uh, a person driving down the highway, somebody in the hospital, all of us are afforded the opportunity to show the love of Christ. Our hearts must capture these opportunities. We're required. This is holiness. This is righteousness. Most of all, this is the image of Jesus Christ that we are to emulate. This is what proves we belong to him. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for one another's, uh, each other's faults because of your love. If you're going to love, it's going to be messy. It's going to require time. But I already went over this with them. Guess what? When you're potty training a child... It takes more than once. Any parent will tell you that. Right? Over and over again. You don't give up after your, your, your uh, uh, two-year-old uh, just decides, I'm not doing this. Oh, we tried it twice. It didn't work. Well, whatever you want to do. No! I hope not. It is love that makes us be persistent and gentle and caring. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Most of all, continue to show deep love for each other, and love covers a multitude of sins. Love. What kind of love? The love of God. The love of Christ. This is the heartbeat of Christ. He covers the multitude of our sins. He cares for others. And we are to care for one another. Believer or unbeliever alike, we are to care and be concerned for people. Stranger or friend, we are to care and be concerned for people perpetually. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 says, But you who are willing to listen, and I love how Jesus says this, you who are willing to listen, what does that mean? Some of you aren't willing to listen. Every preacher has that grieving thought in a sermon. Mine's actually more of, on Tuesday, you nor I will remember what I preached. <laughs> That's through the foolishness of preaching, right? But by the grace of God, anything sticks with us because it's really not the words one speaks. It's the Holy Spirit's working in one's heart. That's what's important. When we gather together and hear the proclaiming of the word, and when we sing songs together, what's important is not the songs that we sang, not the words that were preached, not even the scripture reference. 
It was what the Holy Spirit spoke into your heart. That's what's important. But look at this. For those who are willing to listen, let's be people who are willing to listen, especially to Jesus. I say, love your enemies. This isn't a matter of just loving Christians. It's about loving enemies, too. Do good for those who hate you. Because this is the very nature of Jesus Christ. This is the heartbeat of God. While we were yet afar off, while we were yet sinners, while we were yet living in rebellion and hatred towards Christ, He still loved us. Please know this in this room, no matter where you're at, if there's anyone here today who feels like, man, I have done everything God has told me not to do, I want you to know something has not changed. God's love for you. It's unfailing. He would that none should perish, but that all might have eternal life. There's a real heaven and there's a real hell. And people will enter heaven. I pray you do. And people will enter hell. But I want you to know something. God does not relish seeing people perish in hell. He will grieve for every lost soul. Will people end up in hell? Yes, they will. Because you cannot reject the Son and have hope of eternity or reconciliation with God. You cannot live by rejecting Jesus. If we reject Jesus, we re re reject his Father, and we have no relationship. And there's where hell. But I'll tell you what, even for the person that goes to hell, no matter what they've done, the ultimate thing is they rejected the love of God. Love. This is the heartbeat of God, and this should be the heartbeat of God's people. How do we show love? Can we find time to show love? Again, that old gentleman walking across that highway, all of those people went by. Only one stopped to show love. Only one. Maybe if he would have been there a little longer, someone else would have stopped. I would like to think so. I, I'm sure they would have. But let's not be the people that stay on our moped and zip around them. Let's not be that way. And as we approach these holidays, I want to challenge you. The most important mission you have is the mission that's set right before you. It may not even be the mission you want. Who knows? I don't know if that guy was on his way to a doctor's appointment. Right? A doctor's appointment he didn't want to go to. Right? But on that way, you may think, oh, wow, well, I don't want to do this. This is not God's will for my life. This is, th th these are the visions and dreams and plans I have. Listen, if you're out there in la-la land, you're going to miss the people that are here today. God gives visions and dreams, but understand this. Never are they an excuse to ignore the mission in front of us. Never. People that God put you in, that co-worker that you can't even stand, you're called to love. They're not somebody you should be running away from. They're somebody you should be running to. If you run away from them, you're like the Levi, a Levite or you're like the priest. You move to the other side of the road because you don't want to contaminate yourself. You're too good. You're too important. Run to them. Praise God. Here's some good news. Jesus never distances himself from us. We will sometimes push him away, but he is always there. He says, I never leave you nor forsake you. Even when we fail him, aren't you glad for a grace that abounds that way? Aren't you glad for a love that continues to love in spite of our failures? Maybe no one else does that, but I do that sometimes. And God still loves us. If you're in this room and you feel like, boy, I, I don't know. I, I've messed up so bad. I want you to know something that's absolutely certain. God's love for you is unwavering. Is he going to look past your sin? No, he's going to deal with your sin. But you have to surrender that to him, and he will deal with it. His love for you remains the same, and it always will. That's his incredible grace. In Luke's gospel, chapter 15, we just see the account of the parable of the lost son. Verse 17, it reads this way. It says, and when they finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to share and 
I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say to my father, I have sinned against you, uh, both against heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me in as a hired servant. And so he returned uh, home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. This is the heart of God. I am so thankful we have a God who sees our foolishness, our recklessness, even our incredible offense. Can you imagine how hurtful this son was to his father? He said, I don't care about your relationship. I just want your resources, and I'm out of here. That is not a good feeling. If you've ever been used, and I'm sure that if you've lived very long, you get used by people. But what do we get about the heart of God in this account here in Luke 15? When we have used God, and guess what? All of us in this room have. And when we have rejected fellowship that he desires with him to pursue our own interest and our own sinful selfishness, God's love still remains steadfast. And so I love this picture because here is while he's afar off, we see the Father was still looking. Christ is always looking. And if we are supposed to love one another as Christ loves us, we also must emulate that same attitude and continue to look and hope. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son and he embraced him. I am so glad he doesn't say, well, you messed up your chance. Love goes much deeper than that. Oh, did the son have to make some things right? Absolutely. But at the same time, it's only possible to be reconciled with God through love. He took the time for his son and he loved him. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says this, And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I want you to note this uh, underscores the nature of Jesus Christ. Here we see in both of these accounts the love for the lost. Jesus loved the lost. We need to love those who do not love God because we also once did not love God, but by the mercy of God we have been saved. We also have failed God, but by the mercy of God we have been forgiven. And so we see Jesus having compassion, not just for the brothers and sisters in the church. That needs to be there. That's where we see the reference earlier to covers a multitude of sins. The more you get to know people, the more messed up you realize they are. You can look at the person next to you and tell them, you're messed up. They are. So are you. We really are. We're flawed. We're imperfect. We make mistakes. We fail. Scripture says we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We haven't arrived, but we press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ Jesus. I love that from Philippians. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward that which is ahead of us. And we see that unfold here. Jesus here saw the crowds. He had compassion on them. Because why? They were without a shepherd. They were lost. Church, we have to have a heart for the lost. That's not a missionary's job. It's not a pastor's job. It's not a preacher's job. It's the child of God's job. That's whose it is. It's not an evangelist's job. It's the child of God's job. We have to have a heart for the lost. We have to be compassionate toward them. I want to ask you these questions quickly. Who do you know that is lost and living in sin? Do you know anyone who is lost? Are you taking time to get to know your neighbor? And are you willing to share with them the way of the Lord, the way, the truth, and the life in Jesus Christ? Have you shared that with them? Have you done that more than once? Or say, I shared it with them, now they know. Really? How many times do I not get it on the first time around? Do you ever miss it on the first time around? If you're working on quadratic equations, do you get it down the first time around? It might take a little bit longer than that. And let me say, the, the incredible grace of God 
is bigger than quadratic equations. It's, it really blows the natural mind to understand some of these things. It's bigger than those things. And so, therefore, we need to be willing to share Christ with them, not once, but over again. Are you willing to exercise patience as they figure it out? Are we? Up, oh, I've done my bit. Wash my hands, be a pilot. No. The love of Christ is incredibly patient with us, and we are to model that love. Are we willing to be patient with those who just don't get it? By the way, again, Scripture reminds us, we work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We're still, God's still having to be patient with me. Right? He is working us, molding us, shaping us. This is the grace of God. And to show the love of Jesus Christ, to have the compassion that Christ had, we also have to show then patience. You know what patience is? It's an exercise of time something we are surprisingly, oddly enough, very possessive of time. It's not my time. I, I got things to do. Well, if you want to be like the devil, keep it up. If you want to be like Jesus, you got to stop. Keep doing what you're doing when God pushes, puts the mission in front of you because you're seeing something else is anti-Christ or against the very nature of Jesus. How do we see this? We see it with the woman with the issue of blood. Who touched me? What do you mean who touched me? The whole crowd here. Who touched me? For Jesus, she was healed. Scripture tells us she was healed. But Jesus wanted her to have something more than a healing. He wanted her to know that he saw her. He knew of her plight. He knew of her existence. And he loved her. Oh, he could have walked on. And she would have walked away healed and grateful for the healing. But that is not the only mission of God. In fact, it's only a secondary mission because the greatest mission of God in any of our lives is simply that we might know that God sees us. Some in this room may today be going through difficult things. And you think, does God see me? I've had a terrible life. I've gone through this difficulty. I want you to know, again, your circumstances do not reflect your God. He is bigger than those circumstances. Oh, life is hard. Life is difficult. Life has lots of aches and pains and a lot of heartache. This woman had an issue of blood for 12 years. Jesus could have been very content just letting her be healed. But the love of Jesus could not be content with anything less than her knowing, I see you. I care. I'm concerned for your well-being. That's the very nature of Jesus Christ. We see that as we look at the scripture here in Matthew chapter 20, 29 and following. And Jesus and disciples were in the town of Jericho. There was a large crowd. And there was two men who were sitting on the side of the road, and when they heard Jesus coming that way, they began to shout, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Of course, the crowd said, be quiet, be quiet. And they yelled out all the louder, have mercy on us. And when Jesus heard them, he rushed about his business. No, he stopped and called, what do you want from me? Lord, they said, we want to see. Look this. Jesus felt sorry for them and touched their eyes, and instantly they could see, and they followed him. See the compassion of Christ here? It's not only for the lost, it's for the sick, it's for those struggling. Jesus had compassion. I want to put up on the screen a guy by the name of Joseph. Joseph was in the kingdom of Hawaii. Yes, Hawaii used to be its own kingdom before it became a state uh, as a part of the U.S., uh, and this gentleman, Joseph, went to the fifth largest island in the Hawaiian chain and he ministered to a banished leper community. 
from his young adulthood until 49 when he would die. This picture was taken shortly before his death. He would minister. Why did he go there? Because he had compassion on them. What did he do while he was there? He was the only non-leper. They would banish him. Some 8,000 people lived on this island, banished. So leprosy, Henson's disease, because it actually, they believe, came from China and was spread that way. This man spent his life there, 49 years of old. He, age, 49 years of age, he would die of leprosy himself. But not before he did these things. He started schools. Schools? These guys are going to die anyhow. The dignity of life. They need to have an opportunity to learn and to grow and become something. He started churches in this community. He started dealing with the wounds and the sickness, which eventually ended up being his own demise. He dug the graves. He established, basically took what was chaotic just people saw, and he created a community so that when new lepers would come in, they would feel welcomed and they would feel supported and they were fearful coming from the mainland, being banished. And this guy would minister all in the name of Jesus Christ. And one day when he was uh, using hot water and he was cleaning up after tending to some wounds, he spilt some of that boiling water on his arm and he didn't feel it. And that day he knew I have leprosy. This picture taken shortly before his death, 49 years of age. This man understood what it was like to have the heart of Jesus for those who are hurting. It doesn't stop there. Jesus didn't just show compassion to the sick. He showed compassion to the needy. But I want to bring out something we don't often think of when we think of this next passage. You know the feeding of 5,000, right? Matthew chapter 15. I want to just read a couple of verses in this. Verse 32, it says, And Jesus called his disciples and told them, I feel sorry for these people. Here again, what he, Jesus feels. The guy driving down the road that saw the, the older gentleman trying to figure his way across the road, he felt I don't know about the people who drove around him. Maybe they felt annoyed. Oh, man, what's this guy doing? He's in my way. But that guy that stopped his car, went out and picked the guy up, put him on his back, and hauled him across the street, he felt. And Jesus has called us to be a people who can feel, can connect. Here we see this. And Jesus felt sorry for the people. They have been here with me. For three days, and they have nothing left to eat. That means they had something to eat before this. This is the third day. He didn't want to send them on their way hungry because he felt like they'd be weary and, and tired and might faint along the road. But note something here. I want you to note the very nature of Jesus Christ we often miss in this story. These aren't people without food. They are right now. But they probably have food at home. They brought food with them. They are not necessarily people that are poor and just starving. They're just people in the moment who were hungry. In the moment. See the love of God. See the heart of Jesus Christ. He doesn't care if you went without food for two weeks. He loves you and he's concerned about that. And, or if you've gone without food for one day. He still is concerned with you. Sometimes we kind of break this up. Say, well, you've got to starve for about a month and then, you know, then we should really care. A cup of water in the name of Christ. Surely we'll not lose our reward in heaven. Why? Because even if somebody is remotely thirsty, that's what Bible says, not what Scott Brown says. Remotely thirsty, and you bless them. What do you do? You care. So we need to care for the people who do not have food at all and can't put it on the table, but we also need to care for the person that we might see in the lunch line that is just hungry at that moment. Maybe they forgot their wallet. What does the love of Christ do? It cares. Compassion. Praise God. He treats us this way. 
Jesus took time for the sick, for the needy, for the lost. He took time for those who he didn't know, and he took time for those who were closest to him. He took time for the wealthy. He took time for the poor. See, sometimes we want to segregate all those things, but when you start segregating things, you're being unlike Christ because every human being has the equal value in the eyes of God. And only can we have the heart of God is if we see people as God sees them. He values them. He cares for them. And again, this is the picture. Jesus was on his mission to, to, to heal somebody else, to deal with another sickness when the woman with the issue of blood uh, comes up and she touches him, but he stopped. Luke chapter 8 talks about this. He stopped. Why? The story of Lazarus. Oh, Jesus, if you'd only been here a few days ago, Lazarus wouldn't have died. But why did Jesus not show up a few days before? He was doing things. And just because it appears like things are too late doesn't mean that God doesn't care. He did show up. And He did the miraculous. See, we need to capture this heart. And as we head into this holiday season, I want to just encourage us, the body of believers, let's be a people who just love God and love people. We don't need to put people in groups. I just want to challenge you. You don't need to go out and do some kind of special project. In fact, I think we sometimes miss the objective for the project. People aren't projects. They're just fellow human beings created in the image of God. And I have nothing to offer except for Christ alone. But what He gives you, and in the moment He gives it to you, in the moment He introduces you to that person, that's your ministry. That's your opportunity. Compassion requires love. Love requires time. And no matter the need, we must be present to make and share the compassion of Christ. We have to be present. I want to leave one last closing scripture here. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. It says, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. I love that. How are we to live? With an alert mind. A prayerfully alert mind. Uh, commit yourself, devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. We're going to deal with Thanksgiving next week. But an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us too. That God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan, or plan concerning Christ. What is Paul saying? Pray for opportunities. The guy on the road, the leper colony in Hawaii, they were opportunities. The co-worker that annoys you is an opportunity. The waitress or waiter that dumps the ice down your uh, uh, front of your dress clothes today at the restaurant is an opportunity. The guy that cuts you off at the red light and then you see at the coffee shop is a opportunity. And Paul says, pray, pray for us with an alert mind that God would give us many opportunities to speak of Christ. That is why I am in change. Paul even saw his own suffering as God's plan to put him in the places to minister to the people God wanted them to minister to. I fear we would spend most of our time, I, I, maybe, maybe you're not this way, but sometimes in the flesh I, I struggle a little bit. Lord, get me out of this change so I can do something for God. Right? Get me out of this situation so I can do something for God. Give me lots of money so I can do something for God. Give me lots of time so I can do something with God. Except for Scripture tells us that if we're not faithful in the small things, we'll never be faithful in the big things. You don't need to get out of anything to do something for God. You just need to have His heart. And the very place you're at, 
which you may or may not come out of for a long time, is the very place of ministry God's put you in. That's what Paul says here. I am in these chains for that reason, so that opportunities might be afforded to me. Pray I will proclaim the message as clearly as I should. So what does Paul say? Pray for the opportunities. I'm in these chains for the opportunity. And pray that I articulate well the glory of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's a pretty good prayer there. Alert mind, and then lastly, verse five it says, uh, "Live wisely among those who are not believers, and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive, so that you might have the right response to some people. No, to everyone. This is the heart of Christ. Everyone matters along the journey of life. Your family matters. The family next door matters." Your co-workers matter. The office jerk, if I may say that, matters. The lazy co-worker matters. Right? Everyone matters. And God has placed you and I and will continue to place us. And sometimes it will be as simple as this. I might never see that person again, but I'm here now and they're here. And Jesus is here. How can I show the love of Christ? How will I let him lead me? Will you join with me in prayer? Lord, I pray for us as a body of believers as we approach this Christmas season, Thanksgiving, the holidays that are ahead of us. As we approach this, help our hearts to be hearts of Christ. Help us to see you. Help us to have a compassion for the hurting, the lost, whether those hurts are deep and long or whether they're just momentary. Help us to have that compassion. Help us to have that love and compassion for our brothers and sisters in Christ or those in Christ but kind of still are living in some ways that aren't lined up. Help us to be gracious and kind and loving, holding to truth, but showing your nature. That actually, Lord, we know because you're showing it towards us every single day. Your mercies are new every morning. And Lord, we thank you for that because we uh, could not stand. We could not be in the presence of God but through Christ and Christ alone and your mercies that are new to us every morning. So with that, Lord, help us be instruments and make the most of every opportunity to touch people's lives with the love of Jesus Christ, showing compassion at every turn. Help us not be like the priest or the Levite that we read about so many times. Help us be as the Samaritan was, the good Samaritan. Help us be like you. And we can be that because you're showing us that in our own lives. Because you first loved us, we can love you and we can love others. I thank you for that, and I pray for your grace and help as we examine our hearts and our lives when we walk out of this sanctuary today, that we'll commit ourselves afresh and anew to being the hands and the heart of Christ extended. In Jesus' name. If you need prayer today, the altars are certainly open. But I want to challenge all of us as we walk out of this room today just to check your heart. And yeah, you can check it right now, but I want you to check it every day, all day long. Because if your heart's beating today and it's not beating tomorrow, things are not well. And that's spiritually true as well. I want you to pause and see the people around you and see them not as an obstacle but as an opportunity to show the love of Christ. The guy that's in your way is not in your way but by the divine plan of God. Don't miss those opportunities. And if we can seize those moments more effectively, we will be salt and light in a world that is so much looking for it. Show that love. Go in grace and peace in Christ's name.